So uh, yeah, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to the first talk of the new Easy Talk series. Um, my name is Tim. I'm a PhD student in Pascal's lab, and I'm hosting this series together with Tina, um, who's also a PhD student in Pascal's lab. And since it's the first time we're actually um, doing this or doing the new format, I want to quickly introduce it. So um, the idea of Easy Talks is that it's a bi-weekly event where we invite senior as well as junior scientists and um, kind of provide them a platform to share their uh, latest research in a um, comfortable and um, informal, informal environment. Um, some of these talks will be recorded. So um, this talk today, for example, is recorded, but we just record the section of the talk itself, so not the discussion afterwards. Um, and then our PR team uploads this uh, to the um, easy YouTube channel, um, where I also will post a link. Um, and yeah, so um, if you have any suggestions for speakers, you can also always email Tina or me, um, and we can invite them, and uh, hopefully they will come and speak to us. So um, yeah, we're really happy to have our first speaker today, um, Dr. Frédéric Chavan, um, joining us from Marseille. Um, Dr. Chavan received his PhD in 1999 from the Pierre at Marie Curie University in Paris. Um, after that, he joined the French National Center for Scientific Research, first as a researcher and then since 2016 as a research director. Um, he's a group leader at the Neuroscience Institute at aix marseille University, as well as a co-director of their PhD program in neuroscience. His uh, research is centered on neural operations within visual cortical maps, and he's put out substantial and cutting edge research within this field for the last years. And I think that actually many of you are very familiar with his work, um, and this is why we are extremely happy and excited to have Dr. Chavan as the first speaker of the Easy Talks today. And um, as you can see, he's going to give a talk with the uh, title, Dynamic Representations of V1 Population Along the Apparent Motion Path. And uh, yeah, without further ado, Frederick, the virtual stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks a lot, Tim and Tina, for the invitation, for these very kind words. And it's, uh, it's actually an honor to be the opening session of the EIC talk. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So let's let's try to, as you said, I heard that you said informal. So I have, I'm really happy if it is informal. If you ask me many questions, as I was, uh, as just saying, it's a, it's a great pleasure. Evidently, I would have been much more pleased to be in real uh, with you guys. But uh, let's leave with the constraints of our world now. <laughs> uh, so what I want to talk to you about today is is trying to put together. Uh, uh, work that has been done for, for many years here in the lab on, on uh, non-human uh, primate V1 and a little bit of V2. I will not have the time to go over V2, but we can talk about that. Uh, uh, I try to understand step by step how a population in the primary visual cortex we are seen at the level of the mesoscopic scale, let's say the retinotopic map, can uh, uh, encode uh, information of something that is moving in real in the visual space. Uh, and it may seem something that we, most of us know. I mean, motion information, integration of motion information is something that is uh, been studied in the visual system for many, many years, many, many papers. But, and I will come back to it. Most of what we know is coming from actually motion, which is presented within a stationary aperture, like drifting grating, for instance. So it's line of a cycling and a phase change within a stationary pressure. When something actually moves, it's, there's much less data that we know about that. And, and I would go back to it. So I will start by a brief introduction that can be brief because all of you uh, know very well the visual system. And I just want to point to some important uh, uh, information that I want to, to share so that I can motivate what I'm doing. So the first thing is we all know uh, that the visual system can be activated extremely rapidly. I mean, in the macaque brain, it covers more than 50% of the whole cortex, but in 65 milliseconds after presenting the stimulus, the whole visual system and even beyond in the frontal areas are being activated. And not only you can activate the visual system extremely rapidly, but with this very rapid activation, you can actually perform some complex tasks. And one of the very good examples I like is the examples coming from uh, response to rapid serial visual presentation. You know, when you present a sequence of stimuli and each of them are presented only one time frame, like 16 or 33 milliseconds, and you ask somebody uh, to press a button whenever there is a face, an object, or an animal in the sequence, 
And it's kind of really amazing because you actually don't really know what is, is a person, what kind of animal you saw, what kind of object you saw, but you know you saw an animal and you can press it. So you don't have the detail, but you know that you saw uh, the, the target. And uh, Michel Fabotorp and Simon Thorpe in Toulouse, they made a lot of work on it and, and somehow demonstrated that if you uh, give a response in, let's say, 200 milliseconds, actually you don't have the time to make a lot of processing at each of the step. You, this was the idea of the first spike uh, uh, processing of information, which is going through a very fast feed forward stream of activation from the retina to the visual cortex, to the frontal cortex, to the motor cortex, spinal cord, and then to the muscle. You don't have the time to, to do more. They also did EEG and demonstrated that actually the system can work very efficiently at a very, very fast uh, uh, pace. The issue is exactly what I just said with rapid serial presentation. You can actually do this task, but you cannot recognize the object. It's a really first pass contextual extraction of information that can work this way. But evidently, if you want to have more information, you need more time. Um, and the way usually uh, uh, everybody in the visual system accept that the system can be so fast that uh, one information in the visual world is transformed, transferred into uh, let's say the, the, the dorsal stream, because I'm going to talk about the motion, motion mostly, uh, is that at each of the steps in the retina, in the thalamus, in the one, the information is simply transformed rapidly through a linear, nonlinear operator. Where the linear operator extracts the information here in the, inside the visual space with the, the concentric receptive field lag. And the nonlinearity can be the spike discharge or can be the contrast polarity. We don't care. Actually, this uh, 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 dual operation uh, is actually very important to uh, account for the way the neuron behave in the retina, thalamus, and V1. And if you feed like that this hierarchical system, you can uh, start to generate elongated receptive feed as in V1 with being simple or complex. And you can also continue and go up to empty like that, where this time the linear operator is not in the visual space anymore because you want to extract information mostly on motion direction. So it is within the feature of direction. So you have the line, linear weight in the direction system followed by a non-linearity. And this cascade of linear non-linear operator actually I have to say are quite amazing because they do explain quite well the way the neurons behave in response to a drifting rating, to the drifting plot, to random dot kinetograms. Uh, and and it, it does work very well. But one of the issues here is that all this stimuli, and this is what I was saying in the first uh, uh, sentences, actually are stationary in the visual space. They are centered on the receptive field. So uh, it could feel like that uh, uh, receptive field, which are overlapping one on each other and increasing gradually the hierarchy and the size of the receptive field. But it actually does not move in the visual space, or it does not move in most of the feature space. For instance, this one, as always the same spatial frequency, same direction, same orientation, same position, right? It's only the phase that changes. So in this condition, it does work. And you may see <clears throat> that this system is actually extracting like, you know, the, the pipe of an organ, the information from each of the different positions independently from each other, feeding like that, very fast feed forward system, but with a large of, uh, lot of independence between these points. And if something just simply in the visual world move, and this is what I want to talk about, change position, we actually have not much knowledge of the way the visual system extract this information. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is for, you need to have a mesoscopic view of the activity in each of these areas through, as I will introduce, for instance, optical imaging, but also through ECOGs or Utah arrays or whatever. I mean, all the tools that we have now. So to rephrase this, uh, in a more concrete way, if I present this drifting rating, uh, which is stationary in the feature space, uh, it will activate very rapidly V1, V2, V4, let's say. And if I zoom in V1, we know that there is a retinotopic map and an orientation map among others. And since uh, this stimulus is stationary, it will activate one position of the retinotopic map and one position of the orientation map. And this will stay like that. It will be a stationary stimulus generating a stationary activation of the cortex. But now, if I take a pencil and I throw it like that, for instance, and most of the stimuli we see in everyday life are actually not stationary, it will both change position and orientation, right? And this simple stimulus will generate 
a trajectory of activation in the retinotopic map and a trajectory of activation in the orientation map that will be non-stationary. So if you don't have the ability to record at this scale, you will miss a lot of the information. And what we know from a lot of psychophysics is that the perception of an object which is moving is actually strongly influenced by the past history of the trajectory. All the flash lag illusions that I will come back at the end, for instance, are a, a, a general set of explanation. And the second point is that we know, and all of you know, that information from one point in D1 can be influenced by feedback, can be influenced by intracortical propagations. So we know that this information actually does not stay confined in this kind of uh, 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 tunneling uh, uh, feed-forward uh, uh, projections. So there are many reasons to believe that uh, uh, it's important to have a look at what happens at the mesoscopic scale for an object which is moving. Okay, for that, okay, one second, because once somebody enters, he, uh, things that pop out on my screen. Uh, for that, well, the, the tool I've been using for many, many years is the voltage sensitive dye imaging, uh, which is a fantastic tool in the sense that it's probably the only tool that allows to cover such a wide uh, field of view with a high spatial and high temporal resolution. So uh, let me go back to the here. So the idea is uh, we implant a chamber in the occipital part of the uh, of a monkey. We close it. It's completely sealed. It's completely sterile. This is a dura matter that was cut, put on the side. We put an artificial dura. And when we put the camera over it, this is the kind of field of view we have. This is one millimeter. So we see V1, V2, lunar sulcus, and V4, for instance. So this is the kind of wide field of view we can have. And typically, the pixel uh, of this image can be as, uh, as low as, as small as 20 micrometer, right? And then the idea is we put a die, which is a voltage sensitive die that uh, we left leave for three hours, and it will stain all the membranes. Uh, so we're going to stain dendrites, axons, soma, excitatory neurons, inhibitions, glia. It will stain all the membranes you will see, right? And what we know from many experiments is that changes of membrane potential will be translated into changes of fluorescence. So this probe allows to record directly uh, uh, membrane potential changes. And uh, the idea is that we just simply shine the light to excite the voltage dye and we just collect the information. And under each of the pixels, what we will collect is the average level of depolarization of the neurons which are beneath this pixel. Of course, it's a complex signal uh, and this is uh, uh, its main pitfall. So it's the only signal so far that allows to record over centimeters of cortex with a high spatial and high temporal resolution, but it's a complex signal. And we made a lot of modeling with Sandrine Chemla, where we try to understand what is the origin of the signal. And to make a long story short, uh, in most of the configuration, 60% of the signal is coming from the dendrite of the excitatory neurons of the upper layers. So this is what we can summarize the signal is. So, uh, what happens if, if we use the signal to try to see what is the main pattern to a simple stimulus, which is presented stationary in one position, a local stimulus? So this is what I'm going to show you. Uh, we put our camera of a wide field of cortex in D1. We ask the monkey to fixate and we present briefly a local stimulus, typically of a diameter of 0 0.2 degree. This stimulus will generate an activation of V1, and what we want to see is a pattern of activation which is following this initial activation that can come from intracortical or evidently from feedback activity. Uh, we have many examples. I would just want to show you one from the uh, awake monkey in, uh, in an elongated region of V1, for instance. So what you see is an activation generated by a small drifting grating, and you see that it actually propagates over the cortex to demonstrate that it propagates further than the retinotopic limit, we can compare this activation to an activation uh, uh, induced by an annular stimulus that is all around the local stimulus we've been using. So it's a complementary stimulus, and we generate an activity that uh, goes inside uh, uh, the central uh, uh, representation. And this is the kind of activation you get, right? So this peripheral stimulus generates an activity that uh, uh, completely uh, uh, activates the representation of the inside of the animals. And uh, this opaque region corresponds to uh, the complementary limit of the central and peripheral stimulation. You can see that the propagation goes much further away uh, than, than, the, than the retinotypic limit. 
What this does not say is that whether this is actually due to a real propagation or just a stationary bump that just increase in size, right? It's, it's not a proof that there is a real traveling wave there. And this is work that we've been doing with Lai Muller and Alain Destex. And uh, what, uh, what we did is uh, here, what you see in this movie is that this is the average activation for many, many trials. And what Lyle uh, wanted to do is just look at single trials. So this is what we gave to Lyle. We gave single trials to Lyle and he looked at it. So this is a 3D view and showed it to us and said, come on, there is a traveling wave, but we actually never saw it. So Lyle really uh, uh, was the first to observe them using voltage dye. So this is an example that we see in the trial, in one trial with an activation, which is in this region, the retinal tweak region. And you do see a wave that is propagating out. This is another trial and always a scale of one millimeter here. And the thing is that these waves are never evoked exactly at the same position, exactly at the same latency. So when you average 10 or 15 of them, at the end, it'll just look like a stationary bump because it, it, it goes back to a Gaussian. So Lai developed some uh, uh, nice analysis using uh, uh, Hilbert like transforms and it allowed to extract precisely the phase latency of this response, demonstrating that it's a real propagation that occurs in V1. That's, uh, he arrives in the retinotopic representation of the stimulus and propagates taking like 20, 25 millisecondes. What we also could do is do the same in V2 in parallel. And what we saw is that we actually have the same waves of propagation in V1 and V2 that occurs in parallel uh, with very little latency differences. We can, I can come back to that as explanation why it's so small. Uh, uh, and we could summarize it this way. So we do have a very fast forward activation of V1 and V2 and then a much slower propagation of activity within V1 map and within V2 map. And we believe in all the maps, V3, V4, and MT. And they all occur more or less in parallel, generating possible comparison between what happens in this uh, point of the cortex and this map, point of the map, and this point of the map. Okay. So is there propagation of activity beyond the feed forward imprint? Yes, there is. And we can record it with voltage dye. Okay. So the next step is, uh, uh, can this propagation influence processing of information? And uh, for that, I'm going to tell you a story about just a simple uh, complication of, uh, uh, and, and a gradual complication of the stimulus. So I just presented you a response to a simple local stimulus. What I'm going to show you now is what happens when you present two of them, and in the last part of the talk, three of them, okay? And generating like that a, a trajectory that is, uh, 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 gradually progressing. So this is more or less the apparent motion, right? So the apparent motion, of course, you know, there is a short range, which is most of what we know about the apparent motion, which is a random dot kinetograms, but this is not what we want to show. And the long range, where there is a single object that appears in one position and goes to the other position, giving us the, appar the apparent motion illusion. Uh, there are key differences between the two types of motion. I don't want to go there. Uh, the most important thing is that if we want to generate a motion signal from such stimuli, we need to have spatial and temporal interaction. So if I represent this free uh, uh, stroke apparent motion in a space-time coordinate, what we need is to need to have interaction in space and in time in order to build a representation along the apparent motion path. Uh, this is a kind of a necessity. And what we uh, suggest is that these interactions could come from the horizontal propagation I just showed you. Uh, Importantly, uh, uh, there are some key issues in the apparent motion, which is known as a correspondence problem. So if I present a stimulus in this location in one uh, time frame, and in the next time frame, there are two stimuli that appears, there is the correspondence problem. Did the initial stimuli move to this position or to this position? This is known, also known as the object file problem. Uh, and this is really a big problem in psychophysics that is known, and we don't have many clues of how uh, uh, it's done in the visual system. The important thing that I really like in this theoretical paper from Kahneman and Treisman was they did look at many, many uh, features that can control uh, the correspondence problem, and they found that the most important one uh, uh, is not the object identity, the, the color uh, identity, or the shape, is the spatial temporal contiguity. This is the most important feature to generate the apparent motion illusion and to solve the, the, the correspondence problem. And they also said something that I liked uh, that I will go back to it at the end is object represented in the second display must retrieve a trace of the object in the preceding one. 
And we believe that what we observe is maybe a, a, a basic mechanism uh, of such uh, 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 that provide a solution to such uh, uh, theoretical uh, uh, problems. So let's uh, uh, hold on one second. I remove something which is in the middle. Okay, let's uh, show you the activity that we can have just for a simple two-stroke apparent motion. I will try to go fast because this is uh, published in order to go to the three-stroke apparent motion afterwards. Uh, but of course, stop me if it is not clear. So the first stimulus will generate an activity that propagates on the cortex. And the second stimulus will also generate another activity that propagates on the cortex. And the interaction between these two waves are exactly what we want to look at. So what you will see here is activity generated by two stimuli presented in two different locations, generating an activity in the cortex that propagates. So this is another example that it goes over the retinotopic border. The two stimuli are very far apart in the visual world, but you see that in the cortical world, they do actually propagate and activate themselves, uh, one each other. And uh, you see also that if we present the stimulus for 100 milligrams, it actually stays on the cortex for more than 300 milligrams. So we do have the spatial and the temporal interaction that we are looking for to try to link the activity from these two locations. So when we present the succession of these two stimuli in uh, space time, this is the kind of activity we observe. So the activity from the first dot is generating this location. And when the second stimulus appears, it looks like the activity was kind of attracted by the second stimulus, right? There is a kind of a motion on the retinotopic map uh, that could uh, be uh, uh, decoded by downstream areas as an information of motion. Importantly, if we just look at the, at the linear prediction uh, based on the activity of these two uh, stimuli, what happens is that we don't see uh, this motion on the, on, on the surface for a very simple reason is that the activity from the first stimulus actually stays on the cortex for 300 milliseconds. So at one moment in time, you will have a representation of stimulus one and stimulus two, which are present together on the surface of the cortex. So we will not generate a motion on the surface of the cortex. So we can look at the, 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 the non-linearity by comparing the observed uh, response to the apparent motion to the linear prediction. And this is what I'm going to show you now. Blue corresponds to suppression. And the, so when the second stimulus appears, there is a strong suppression that appears in the representation of the second stimulus that propagates backwards, so in the opposite direction of the apparent motion, to suppress the residual activity from the first stimulus, okay? This suppression can be best seen if, uh, uh, so this was the work of Sandrine and Alex, uh, if you look at the spatial temporal uh, uh, representation. So, this activity that I showed you here is represented this time in space time coordinates. The first stimulus is presented here, generated an activity in this location with a propagation, okay, that pre activates this second region. When the second stimulus is presented here, you have a second activation which arrives here. If we do uh, the similar representation for the non linearity, when the second stimulus appears, it generates a suppression in this location that propagates in the opposite direction and generates a strong suppression in this location, suppressing this activity here, hereby generating this kind of space time slant. Okay? Uh, this is in one direction, this is in the opposite direction, and you have an opposite uh, uh, suppressive wave. And actually, uh, in all, I really say all the trials, in all the conditions we did in more than three monkeys, I know it's not enough, Pascal, but yet, uh, uh, we do observe systematically this suppressive wave. So this is what I'm showing you now here. This is a cortical speed. <clears throat> I put it different direction. This is the observed evoked activity, this is the observed suppression, and this is apparent motion speed. So if we make a slow stimulus, very long uh, separation in time, we observe uh, this uh, comparison uh, uh, propagation that goes in one direction with one speed and another direction with one speed. If we increase the speed with the stimulus, which is faster and faster, the actu actually, the, the, the evoked uh, uh, propagation speed and the evoked suppressive uh, uh, speed are always at the same range. And if we make just uh, 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 an histogram out of that, we do observe that this suppression is absolutely not uh, uh, affected by the apparent motion speed. So it's something different than the apparent motion speed is due to something which is independent. Secondly, uh, so this is in two monkeys, uh, but importantly, we also did the same thing for many other parameters, for instance, for the spatial spread, uh, the spatial extent of this uh, suppressive wave, which is what you see here, which is completely comparable to the spatial extent of the evoked wave. And in all regards, the suppression and the evoked activity have exactly the same feature. 
So somehow it's uh, uh, suggesting that they arrive from the same phenomenon, from the same mechanism, which is most probably due to intracortical propagation that actually have exactly the speed of the kind of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 meter per second. So one of the issue is that uh, we know that these intracortical uh, uh, connections are mostly excitatory in the long range, right? So how can this mostly excitatory long range intracortical activity lead uh, to a suppression? This was uh, 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 one of the issues we wanted to, to, to uh, solve. So for that, we actually uh, worked with uh, the group of Alain Destex and made a, a model, which is a mean field model, uh, along the trajectory of V1. Each of the nodes of the model is uh, uh, made out of, uh, sorry, of uh, 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 statutory and inhibitory network. We uh, introduced uh, horizontal interaction in the inhibitory, between inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons. Of course, for excitatory neurons, it goes much further than inhibitory neurons. And we just try to uh, adjust the system, so the, the, the model, so that it can uh, reproduce the kind of pattern of activity we have in, uh, in response to a single stimulus as presented here. So this is cortical distance and time. It's always a space time. And you see that this stimulus generates also a propagation that we can record with uh, the mean field model. And the second position is there. So uh, this is what uh, Jan initially developed and then Matteo Divolo just uh, uh, continued after and uh, demonstrated that we can also reproduce the pattern of activity we have with uh, the apparent motion. And the idea is, okay, so can we actually reproduce the suppression? Do we also observe the suppression just by having this kind of model? So just by having this kind of model is not completely correct. What we uh, uh, did is that we introduced differential gain between excitatory and inhibitory neurons because the idea is that, uh, and this is also, it's not or completely original, and this is, was introduced already uh, by Tzodix in 98 and also uh, by the group of Ken Miller uh, of the, this is the idea of the inhibitory stabilized network that actually excitation can arrive into a balanced excitatory inhibitory uh, network and because the inhibition has a higher gain, it can be activated strongly and earlier, and likewise generate a suppression locally. This is very important. So this is what we obtained. Actually, by having a differential gain between excitation and inhibition, we did observe the similar kind of suppression we had uh, in, the, in, the, in the experiments, demonstrating that this suppression can be explained by a propagation of excitation in the cortex. Uh, we actually afterwards played with uh, uh, sorry played with the difference of gain between in between neurons which were fast spiking here and excitatory neurons which were regular spiking. So uh, the result that is shown here is for the red curve is these guys here. We could either increase oh sorry decrease the difference of gain between excitation and inhibition or increase the difference of gain between excitation and inhibition. And if we increase the more we increase the more suppression we obtain. Uh, the second important thing in what we did in the model is, uh, okay, so we, the, the spontaneous excitatory activity was also important, but more importantly was uh, if that we had the model playing, interacting at the conductance level. If the model was completely transformed into a current-based mo uh, 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 current model, uh, uh, actually there is an error here, this is the contrary, this is a current-based model, and in the current base model, we could not observe suppression, but we only observe uh, a facilitation. So uh, we could observe suppression only if there was a differential gain between excitation and inhibition, and if the interactions were conductance-based. This was the two important things uh, that the model showed. Uh, do I have the time? Uh, maybe I will go very rapidly uh, in this. Uh, Okay, so, so we observe suppression we, that allows to have a, 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 a nice spatial temporal representation of the apparent motion, uh, but we just wanted to go a little bit further and demonstrate that actually it is important for representing the stimulus in the space time. Uh, and uh, one of the things we did was uh, developing a, a decoding model. So this is a spatial temporal activity we have in the apparent motion sequence or in the linear prediction. And the idea was uh, at each point in time to see whether the spatial profile of this activity was looking more like the spatial profile to uh, the stimulus in the upper position or in the lower position, or both of them or none, 
right? So we made a probabilistic uh, decoding model. So this is the probability that uh, in this pattern of activity that a blank stimulus is presented. And you see that when the stimulus is presented, it goes from one to zero. Then this is the probability that the first uh, stimulus is presented that goes to one very rapidly. And when we present the second stimulus, this is the probability that the second stimulus appears. And importantly, this is the probability that both of them uh, were presented at the same time. When we do the same thing on the linear prediction, we obtain evidently at the beginning the same thing, but when the second stimulus is presented, what happens is that the probability that stimulus two is presented or stimulus one and two together are presented is about the same. So the representation is quite ambiguous for the system and, and it cannot uh, 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 precisely uh, represent that one stimulus has changed position uh, 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 from stimulus one to stimulus two. This is average across many, many conditions in one monkey. In the second monkey, it gives uh, the same result. You see that there is a only transient activity of uh, 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 increase of probability of having stimulus one and two at the same time, followed by a strong increase of having stimulus two uh, uh, presented. And this is in the linear predictions average across all, the, all of them. So we see that it's uh, ambiguous. So to summarize this second part, uh, we had systematic, really systematic suppressive wave uh, in response to apparent motion that had the similar property as one from the evoked wave. So it's probably coming from intracortical connectivity. With the model, we demonstrated that actually the suppression can be observed if there is interactions that operate at conductance level and if there is a differential gain between excitation and inhibition. And uh, we suggest that one function of this suppression is to keep track of the object identity over the apparent motion apparent motion path. So the suppression could be a way, very basic, simple way to solve the correspondence problem. The second stimulus appears in one location, there is a kind of a retro propagation that says, I have the solution and now you can uh, uh, shut down your activity. This was what Kahneman and Treisman uh, proposed actually. Okay, so if there is no question in this part, I will go to uh, the third part. So what happens after the second stroke? Uh, and this is really the idea is to go progressively along the, the path. So now, instead of having only two stimuli, we have three stimuli. But actually, adding a third stimulus is, is uh, increasing uh, a lot the complexity. Because the first stimulus will generate this propagation, the second this propagation, and the third one. And at the end, you have a kind of a complex embedded uh, uh, propagations uh, among all these elements of the network, which makes the whole thing a little bit more complex than just a second stroke, than just two strokes. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so this is what I'm going to show you in voltage dye imaging. Uh, the first thing we wanted to see is whether we still had the same kind of suppressive wave with the two stroke and the three stroke. So we, I'm showing you now so just a replication of the previous uh, data that was published. Uh, so this is a spatial temporal response for one stroke and another stroke in two different positions. This is a response to the apparent motion uh, in two strokes. So you have the activity here and activity here. And, uh, suppression that goes in the opposite direction. So you're just replicating what I just showed you. Uh, and this is what the model did uh, uh, that is uh, perfectly uh, uh, explaining the result that we have. So what happens now if we have a third stimulus, okay, in the middle of, of this path? Uh, this is what the model would predict here. And uh, it generates an activity which is much more continuous. You don't see the transients anymore. This is the first observation and the second observation is what uh, do you expect in terms of suppression? Actually, what you expect is to expect to have two suppressions that will be emitted by the stimulus two and by the stimulus three, and they will interact together. And just by analyzing them geometrically, we know that the expected response is to have a suppression which is much faster. We don't see the same propagation. And this is indeed what the model showed, that the suppression actually occurs more or less uh, uh, simultaneously over the whole cortex, just because uh, 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 this is really due to uh, the precise uh, uh, speed that we use, uh, spatial separation and temporal separation. Of course, if you change them, you will not have the same uh, pattern. But this is exactly what uh, the model is predicted. So what we observed when we just added the third stimulus that generated an activity in the middle of the path is indeed a more continuous representation of the motion in the, in the cortical space. Now we have really the impression that there is a continuous motion. And uh, the suppression has exactly the pattern that is expected from the model. So 
I will not go into detail, but uh, actually we do show that uh, the suppression that you observe here is indeed what is predicted by a successive uh, wave of suppressive activity. Uh, there is also a second parameter that I forgot to show you here is that the suppression is supposed to increase in strength, uh, which is exactly what we observe also in the data. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, the, the first thing. So when we add more stimuli, and we also did it for five, seven, and more strokes, and it systematically obey to the same kind of rules. Uh, but this is not what I want to show you now. What I wanted to show you now is, is uh, actually what Sandrine and Kevin did. They really looked at the data more carefully and observed something which was uh, a bit uh, uh, striking. So I will go back to the data. More precisely, in this time, not in space time, but in spatial coordinate, this is space space. Okay, this is a cortex view from above. This is activity generated by the first stimulus, the second stimulus, and the third stimulus alone. And this is the activity generated by the free stroke apparent motion that you see the activity uh, uh, starts from this position and then propagates on the cortex and finish here. Okay, we do see a real propagation on the cortex. Actually, when you compare the activity which is evoked by the free third stroke in the apparent motion sequence with the first stroke alone, we are, uh, and this is the first thing that Kevin saw in, in, in one session, uh, one of the uh, key points is that we saw and observed that there is a difference in this activity. Actually, what we said is that if we really want to compare them, we have to take into account that there was an activity generated by the two first stroke in the free stroke apparent motion sequence. So what Kevin did, and this is what I'm going to show you in the next slide, he compared the activity of the third stroke alone and the third stroke within the free stroke apparent motion, taking into account the past activity. So this is what we have here. This is an, an ex another example, actually, uh, of the response to the first stroke alone, which is generating this kind of pattern activity on the cortex. This is uh, the equivalent visual distance. So this is the cortical distance that was transformed by Kevin into visual coordinate, taking into account the magnification factor. And you see here are the single trials, and this is the average. So this is kind of pattern bump of activity generated by the first stroke. And uh, sorry. And, this is what happens if you look at the representation of the first stroke within the free stroke apparent motion. And you do see that there is a displacement of activity uh, uh, toward the apparent motion uh, direction. And this is observed at all the single trials uh, for all the sessions that you will see. And this is strongly significant. So uh, this is one example. I'm going to show you another example on another monkey. And uh, actually this is Three monkeys and four sessions, uh, still not enough, but it's getting better, Pascal. And for each of them, uh, I saw you, it's, it's a recurrent joke now, Pascal. <laughs> for each of these examples, we do see, so these are all the single trials from all these sessions, we do see systematically uh, a displacement of activity of the first stroke compared uh, within the free stroke apparent motion compared to the first stroke alone. And this is all these uh, trials which are put together in the same histogram with a very strong uh, uh, significant result. So uh, and we call that uh, apparent motion extrapolation, right? It's done from the apparent motion. It goes beyond uh, the third stroke. So the first thing we wanted to see is whether the model in itself and the suppression that we observe in the model is enough to extend the result we have. So we really took the model of the one we developed for Shemla one 2019, did not change anything in the parameter. Actually, we did not tell Matteo what we were expected as a result. And we just asked him to show us the pattern of activity to the first stroke alone compared to the pattern of activity to the first stroke when it is embedded in the free stroke apparent motion. And you do see a displacement, which is smaller, but which is there. And of course, nothing has been changed in the model. What is, uh, Matteo is doing now is changing the suppressive strength to see whether it actually, oops, sorry, which actually could explain the kind of effect we have, because this is what I forgot to tell you. Actually, the effect in the visual coordinate is not small, is 0.5 degree. It's a, actually an effect which has the same separation between each of the uh, strokes in the apparent motion sequence. So it's actually quite a strong effect, and the model cannot account for such uh, 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 special scale, but it can account for the fact that the activity has been moved toward uh, 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 the uh, apparent motion direction. So 
the last thing I want to, to show you is actually that this could have consequences at the perceptual level. We know that motion extrapolation is one of the possible explanations for the effect of the flash lag, for instance. So we know it's kind of important. So we wanted to see whether you're using exactly the same stimulus, our perception of the position of the first stroke is affected. So for that, uh, we we uh, made an experiment, we made a psychophysics experiment together with Martin Zint, who is uh, an expert in psychophysics. And this was designed together with Kevin, where <clears throat> we simply ask somebody to fixate a red dot and we presented the stimulus in one location and just ask the person to make a saccade toward this location, okay? And we ask the person to make hundreds of saccades in order to see uh, uh, the precision of uh, the saccade. So this is the precision in visual coordinate to one position. And the idea is that we did five different positions separated by 0.5 degree. And a uh, hundred of trials show that actually you could tease apart the, 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 the cloud of uh, the landing saccades to each of these positions. So you do have a precision which is enough to tease apart 0.5 degree differences. So this is the first thing we wanted to check. And then we just presented the apparent motion sequence towards uh, uh, the middle position, going either in the downward uh, 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 direction or the upward direction, but the position was exactly the same in these two locations. So if there is an effect of extra uh, upper motion extrapolation, we should see a difference in where the saccade ends. And this is actually what we had. In the downward upper motion sequence, the saccade endpoints were lower than in the upward upper motion sequence. So if I put together all the data points into a uh, uh, histograms actually we do see a very significant difference which is about 0 0.5 to 1 degree about the same range as what we saw in the monkey actually in this in the range we choose for uh, the eccentricity the magnification factor is comparable so it's we're quite happy to have this kind of result we did it of course on purpose this is one uh, 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 subject this is another subject we did that now on eight subjects only one did not work but seven actually they always show this kind of uh, uh, difference. So it's still ongoing experiments, but we are quite confident. That's why I'm showing you the results to you that it will be replicated and we want to do it over 20 uh, subjects to make nice statistics out of it. So with that, <clears throat> uh, I, I will just uh, wrap up. So in the first stroke, multiple suppressive waves are generated in response to multiple stroke apparent motion. I did not show you all the, uh, uh, subsequent experiments with more stroke, but it's always the case. This results in displacing the representation of the third stroke in the direction of the apparent motion, so being kind of some kind of extrapolation. And of course, this could have implication for flash lag illusion. So you may all be familiar with flash lag, where the position, the perceived position of a moving object is always uh, uh, displaced towards the motion direction compared to the perceived position of a stationary object. I just show you what I'll just show you one example here in this movie, where uh, the the dot the square is moving to the right, and when it appears in the middle of the trajectory, we present a dot exactly aligned uh, vertically on it, and you should all perceive. I don't know if it works uh, on the on the zoom, but it, you should all perceive uh, the stimulus, the static stimulus on the right to uh, the moving stimulus on the right to the static stimulus. And if I actually slow down, you see that it was presented exactly at the same moment. So in the mechanism that, oops, sorry, in the mechanism that people uh, put forward to explain the, the, the flash lag, one of them is motion extrapolation. And we believe that what we see here is, could be an example of motion extrapolation in the flash lag. So uh, to summarize everything. So <clears throat> what I first showed you is in response to a flash stimulus, and this is systematic we observe, we have intracortical wave that travels in the cortical map that can have some important computational consequences. When we now present a stimulus of a two stroke apparent motion, we observe systematic suppressive wave, whatever the uh, apparent motion speed, uh, spatial separation, temporal separation, we always observe these suppressive waves. And we propose that this could be a mechanism to explain away ambiguous representation, likewise kind of solving the correspondence problem, that being a very basic way of solving the correspondence problem. Now, if we add a third stroke to the apparent motion sequence, what we observed and that we did not observe in the two-stroke apparent motion, we observed that the representation of the third position is displaced in the motion direction. 
uh, and this is observed in uh, voltage dye, is observed in the model and observed in psychophysics. And we believe that these effects can contribute to mislocalization illusions, such as the one in flash lag, but many others. And I just want to finish by thanking the actors of all what I'm presented. So there are the experimentalists on the top, Alex, Sandrine, Kevin, and recently Salvatore that just started his PhD on that, and Martin for the psychophysics. And below are all the theoretical and computational neuroscientists uh, that uh, work uh, and with this. I uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention.